Hello, my name is Brian Ferguson. I'm graduating in the commercial music tech track, and my senior project is on the use of amps and amp simulators in the recording and mixing process. The purpose of my senior project was to research and practice the use of amp simulators and then compare this technique to recording and mixing real amplifiers. The goals of my project were to record, mix, and master three sound-alike style recordings, one using amp simulators only, one using only real amps, and then one where I use both. I also wanted to develop an understanding of the pros and cons of both of these techniques, and then use this knowledge in future recording and production projects. First, I'll quickly discuss the parts of an amplifier. The preamp shapes the sound and can be made of either a vacuum tube or a transistor. The power amp increases the voltage of a signal, raising its volume, and can also be made out of a vacuum tube or a transistor. Then we have the speakers, which are transducers, meaning they convert electrical energy into sound, and speakers can be different sizes and different materials. And lastly, we have the cabinet, which houses all of the components and can be open or closed back open back cabinets having better bass response. I mentioned these components of an amplifier because in the amp simulator software that I used, Bias Amp 2, you can change the settings and components of each of these parts. To record with an amp simulator, you're going to need a DI box connected to your interface and your amp sim software of choice. You have several software options including Waves, Guitar 3, Plugin Alliance, Rock Rack V3, the Apple Amp Designer, which comes free with Logic Pro, IK Multimedia's Amplitube, and the software that I used and is my personal favorite, Bias Amp 2. AmpSim software has existed for a few decades, but how does it work? First, it samples an audio signal, then it creates graphical data of the amplitude of each overtone frequency from that signal. Then, using what's called a Fourier transform, the software creates a mathematical formula that approximates your audio sample. Finally, a new audio signal is processed using this formula. AmpSim software also recreates speakers and cabinets using impulse response technology and simulates microphones using a graph of their frequency response. Now I'll show an example of how I decided to process my guitar sound for bomb track. The first clip will be the DI tracks for the stereo rhythm guitars and the bass in the center. And the second clip will be those same three tracks processed through bias amp. And after we hear both clips, I'll discuss the decisions I made when I was processing them in the amp simulator. Here's the same tracks processed. I wanted the bass to sound bright and punchy, so in the tone stack I boosted the bass frequencies and treble frequencies. But I also wanted the bass to sound clear and present, so I used medium gain and light distortion and an American style compression transformer. At the end of the line, I used a simulated SM57 to capture the crunch of the bass and I used a ribbon to capture the warmth. As for the guitars, I was trying to match the sound of a Marshall JCM 800, which is used in the original recording. So this is going to be a higher gain setting while cutting the bass and mid frequencies and boosting the treble. I also added some distortion in the power amp. This time I used an SM57 right on the center of the cone to capture the bulk of the sound, and a simulated 414 condenser between the cone and the rim for added color. While I was recording the DI guitar and bass tracks, I was also recording real amps in parallel. My bass setup was a Fender Rumble 200, an MXR bass compression pedal and bass overdrive pedal, uh, recorded with an SM57, and a Sennheiser E602, which is a large diaphragm dynamic, each placed three inches from the grill, slightly off-center. My guitar setup was a Marshall JCM600 for bomb track and electric feel, and a Fender Hot Rod DeVille for just another face. 
On electric feel, I used a TC Electronic chorus pedal, and I recorded both amps with an SM57 and a T-Bone ribbon mic placed one inch from the grill, slightly off-center. Now let's compare bomb track mixed with real amps that I recorded, and the same song, but processing DI guitars through an amp simulator. Hey, yo, it's just another bomb track. And here's bomb track with DI guitars processed through bias amp 2. We've compared the sound quality and recording techniques between amplifiers and amp simulators. Now let's look at the other factors that should affect your decision when you're deciding which to use on a record. A big pro for recording amplifiers is the natural variance between them. Even if two amps are the same model, the components within them will react differently, creating a tone that is unique to that record. With live recordings, you also have more freedom with your mic choice and placement, giving the recording engineer as many possibilities as he can imagine. With quality amplifiers and microphones costing several hundreds of dollars to even thousands of dollars, the decision to record live amps can be an expensive one, especially when you consider how much more equipment you need to record them. You need mics, mic stands, XLR cables, and any type of soundproofing or sound absorption materials. Other issues to consider are a bad room sound, or if you're recording multiple instruments in the same room, the issue of bleed, there's also the issue of proximity effect, which can distort your recordings. The obvious larger issue is the finality of the tracking process. When you record with real amps, the take you get is the take you have. And the only way to retrack that recording is if you recorded the DI guitar signal and then ran that signal through a reamp box back into the amp. And if it's not in the same session, you may even have to re-mic the amp. On the other hand, amp simulators are much less expensive generally costing around $50 to $200, and with an amp sim software you generally get hundreds of different amp sounds. You also require less equipment to record with an amp sim. As mentioned before, you really just need a DI box, your interface, the software, and your necessary cables. The big draw with amp simulators is the fact that you can change the sound without having to retrack. You simply go into the software, change the settings you want, you don't have to remic the amp, reset it, or get a new take. However, amp simulators do have their drawbacks. Most have a limited number of mic options, generally one of each kind, sometimes two dynamics or two condensers. If you're tracking directly through the software, you're going to have to deal with the issue of latency. And if you're running a lot of plugins or possibly have an older computer, you might have to deal with a processing power issue. With a better understanding of the pros and cons of using both amps and amp sims in the tracking and mixing process, let's look at an example where I combine these techniques. In this clip, you will hear that the rhythm guitars in the chorus, the lead guitars, and the distortion swells and feedback were all recorded with real amps, while the two parallel bass tracks, both clean and distorted, and the rhythm guitars in the verse were processed through an amp simulator.
advancements in technology, amp simulators have never sounded better and have become a staple in the professional recording community. This concludes my presentation. These are my project references. Thank you for listening.